It's December 26th, 2022. This is Rook. Well, hi there. Welcome to episode 226 of Rook. Wake up, Iranian diaspora. Wake up and raise your voice. Wake up, Iranian brothers and sisters. Wake up to this being our moral choice. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Hello to you from Toronto. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Durud Bashama. Don't let up. Don't let the regime murder more of our kin. Wake up, Iranian diaspora. Wake up and make sure we win. It's been over a hundred days of uprising, and maybe it's time for a little shakeup. It seems for some Iranians around the world, the revolution has become dull. Back to posting cute selfies on Insta. Back to regular business to fill the lull. And we cannot be telling the good souls inside Iran what to do, but for those of you outside, this is on you. Are you still waiting to make sure, still hedging your bets? Because at this point, equivocation is as bad as it gets. Try to heed these words and let them echo in your head. Wake up, Iranian diaspora. Wake up and raise your voice. Wake up, Iranian brothers and sisters. Wake up to this being our moral choice. And a note of contrition to those of you who have been super active. Apologies to the women and men who have never parted ways. But to a lot of you out there tired of scrolling and sadness, are we somehow spoiling your holidays? Because there is a creeping feeling that you want change in Iran and you love the revolution and we know it, you can't wait for the day. As long as others do the hard work, you'll happily meet up in some future liberated Tehran cafe. Try to heed these words and send a message to the world. Wake up, Iranian diaspora. Wake up and raise your voice. Wake up, Iranian brothers and sisters. Wake up to this being our moral choice. Because this is a golden opportunity. This is the chance. This is the moment of their final dance. Don't let up. Don't let the regime murder more of our kin. Wake up, Iranian diaspora. Wake up and make sure we win. Do this for Massa, Nika, Kion, Sarina, Khodanur, Majid Reza, and for thousands of innocent young Iranians who've been detained and tortured as they fight for change, and millions of Iranians who fought these bastards for 43 years and had their livelihoods rearranged. Don't doubt the resolve of those living in Iran. They're understandably frozen in fear. This is a murderous regime that has signaled it will execute dissenters with no rhyme or reason any time this year. For those of us on the outside with a conscience, surely there is a different consideration. While those in our ancestral homeland are killed and tortured, we have a moral obligation. Speak out, tell your neighbors, confront your representatives, don't give up the fight, gather, assemble, and continue the pressure and bring the opposition together to unite. We knew they weren't going to leave without a first hint. We knew this was always going to be a marathon, not a sprint. Try to heed these words and send a message to the world. Wake up, Iranian diaspora. Wake up and raise your voice. Wake up, Iranian brothers and sisters. Wake up to this being our moral choice. This is a golden opportunity. This is the chance. This is the moment of their final dance. Don't let up. Don't let the regime murder more of our kin. Wake up, Iranian diaspora. Wake up and make sure we win. Coming up, a big new edition of Rook, featuring academic and activist Sana Ebrahimi, economist and sanctions expert Dr. Saeed Qasiminejad, and social media star and engineer Amir Nezam Samadabadi, plus the Rook Roundtable. This is Rook, episode 226, The Uprising. Wake up, Iranian diaspora. Wake up and raise your voice. Here we are in the Rook studio in Toronto on Boxing Day. Boxing Day in many parts of the world, the day after Christmas. Mm -hmm. It was a very strange Christmas, I found. It was. I did uh, just a confluence, a mixture of emotions. Mm -hmm. Uh, I respect those who wanted to or could find the energy to celebrate. It wasn't really in my... um, my cards mm-hmm. to be able to to feel up to a full on Christmas celebration yeah. this year, even though my family has always celebrated Christmas, just didn't feel it. Um, and so we had a kind of a, a modest 
and um, quiet, quiet yeah. Christmas. Yeah. It's hard with the with the, with the news coming out of Iran to to sort of get it up for mm-hmm. these holidays. Today is Boxing Day, which means that for a lot of places. Um, Around the world, it's it's a holiday, um, I guess, for a lot of places around the world, and certainly in the West. Um, but we are here, mm-hmm. and we have quite a show coming up that I guess is consistent with the the words I just gave there, the essay of a wake up Iranian diaspora, wake up and raise your voice. Mm-hmm. Uh, some guests who've been very active and and who I think would be on that strand of of wanting people to wake up and and um, take charge here and and do what we can in the diaspora to support the the cause of freedom in Iran. Coming up on this show, economist and sanctions expert Dr. Saeed Qasemini-Jad. So uh, you've probably seen uh, Dr. Saeed on. He's one of those guys who does actually end up on a lot of Western media, English programs. Um, he's a PhD in finance and economics. And so he talks about uh, uh, economic issues and particularly Iran's economy. And he is one of those who steadfastly believes in maximum pressure. Mm-hmm. I think that is a term that emerged in the previous uh, American administration, um, but there are those who believe it really should be applying now and mm-hmm. who are trying to push the Biden administration um, to apply this maximum pressure, which would include enforcing the sanctions on Iran that already exist, right. but apparently are not being enforced. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so Iran's finding ways around this to, to continue making money and bringing in revenue and having a hard currency and and um, also to impose new sanctions. So he's a big advocate of that. Dr. Saeed Qasemineshad coming up. Also here in the Rook studio, social media star and of course engineer, everybody even if they've got, <laughs> even if he's a poet, but he's also an engineer yep. because he's Persian. Uh, Amir Nezam Samad Abadi. Mm-hmm. And Amir Nezam, you may have seen if you're, if you're on Instagram and you're on YouTube, um, he's the the nice looking guy who does interpretations of Persian poetry and literature. He's got a big following, so you may have seen him out there in um, social media land. He has recently turned his attentions uh, to the revolution. He's based in Atlanta, Georgia. It's wow. an interesting place for a, um, for a Persian <laughs> social media podcast that he does uh, in, in, in Persian. Uh, but he happens to be in Toronto right now, so we'll bring him into the Rook studio. Very much looking forward to having Amir Nezam Samad Abadi. I like his voice. He's a very gam a, voice. A, a warm baritone. <laughs> yeah. How dare he? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and coming up first in just a little bit, academic and activist Sana Ebrahimi. So once again, if you've been following the revolution and you're active on Twitter and Instagram, you may have seen Sana's posts because she is very prolific. She just came from Iran about three years ago to the United States. She's based in Chicago. And um, she is also a, a, a PhD in computer science. Uh, and an academic, but she's been an activist, but she's been very active when it comes to the revolution, speaking out, um, supporting all the, the cause, and in particular, targeting uh, reformists and targeting Nyack and calling them out. And um, once again, consistent perhaps with that idea of maximum pressure mm-hmm. and not you know, making any deals with this yeah. this regime or any any kind of compromise. Sana Ebrahimi, she has a quite a personal story of her own too, coming from Iran and her family background. Hopefully, she'll allow us to get into a bit of that. That's coming up in just a few minutes. Um, quite a show, so stick yes. around for this whole thing. Let me do my official hellos. Hello, Pega. Hello. And hello, Shia. Hi, Ezza. Let's do some Rook roundtabling before we get to our guests. So, uh. I thought we need to mention that today is the 40th day of the passing of mm-hmm. some important individuals. This is a, a day that is commemorated in, in Iran. Uh, it's a big deal, the 40th day after somebody is, dies. And did, it was 40 days ago today, it's 40 days ago, I guess, uh, today marks 40 days, that Keon, little Keon Pierfalak, the 10-year-old, who has become one of the 
symbols, yeah. the, the young icons of those we've lost uh, to this regime and, and uh, those we have to remember to keep this revolution going. It was 40 days ago that we lost him, that he was killed, as I recall, in a car mm -hmm. with his um, family. And this, this has been such a strange time period where on the one hand, it feels like it's been, you can snap a finger and it's been, it's just gone so quickly since mm -hmm. the killing of Massa Amini. On the other hand, uh, it's been three and a half months now and it's hard to sometimes imagine a time before. It's been so epic yeah. that I, I, I can sometimes not visualize mm -hmm. what it was like before we had all these these sad stories in our life and the inspiration of those who've been on the front lines in Iran. But part of the sad stories and part of the inspiration has been someone like Keon, who we marked the 40th day of passing today, along with some others. Yeah, um, along with uh, Aylar Haqi, Seper Maqsudi, and Hamid Reza Ruhi. Um, and I mean, just to what you were saying about this feeling like a complete before and after, um, I was looking at a friend's Instagram page and I was kind of scrolling back and, and I saw videos of uh, a trip that this friend had taken to Iran not that long ago. I mean, you know, maybe six, seven months ago. And to see some of those videos, it just, it looked so different. I couldn't mm. imagine Iran the same way, um, just in light of everything that's been happening. I'm so used to seeing videos of, of you know, the, the demonstrations and, and girls without their hijab and... Graffiti. Graffiti, yeah. exactly. It was It was almost weird to see the videos and everything i mean we've talked many times about how everything has changed mm -hmm. since the revolution certainly for iranians around the world let alone inside iran no matter what happens with this revolution everything has already changed yes, and everything that you see now it's a, to, to your point is correlated or cross-referenced against what's happening right now mm -hmm. so if you see a a video of 1970s Iran you you don't just see it as a historic piece you mm -hmm. see it as as cross-referenced against what is happening exactly. there today right yeah. um I also noticed that did you see Reza Pahlavi I, I, I guess he tweeted I read the tweet and interpreted it as he's he's trying to encourage people mm -hmm. to get out in the streets yeah you read the tweet more carefully to me and, and I guess he doesn't exactly say that but I thought this this marked a moment where Reza Pahlavi, who's always named as one of those in the opposition, who's, you know, certainly a name mm -hmm. and uh, potentially one of the opposition leaders. Um, I thought this was him stepping up a little bit. He's been very supportive of mm -hmm. things going on since the beginning of uh, since September. But he, but in terms of saying, "Come on, we got to have the back of the families get out there," uh, I thought this was maybe a little bit more of a step that he's taking. Yeah. Well, I actually first saw. Um a, like a news clipping of it uh, on Instagram. I saw, um, I, I can't remember what page it was on that I saw, but there was almost like this um, this quote or something that said, you know, Reza Pahlavi has asked the people to come to the streets um, to commemorate the 40th day of passing for Little Keon and, and some other names that we just mentioned. Um, and so I went to Twitter and I looked at his tweet and the way I read it, I mean, he, he kind of said, he alluded to the fact that the brave people of Iran won't leave the families of those who have lost loved ones alone. And I think at the end of it, he said something like, um, we, will, we will take Iran back. Mm. And so that's, that was the tweet that I read. Very different than him calling on people to take to the sure. streets. But, but I understand you know, some that, people, yeah. yeah, that he was kind of alluding to that. But nonetheless, I think it was a very powerful message. Yeah, and... About the Kiam Pir Falak uh, for the Este Memorial, it's happening in Isa, and the video I just saw, there's a huge actually uh, people. I mean, the huge crowd uh, gathered, and uh, most of them actually they they brought a rainbow rang oh. Come on, yeah. And also, it happened. It happened in Isa, and I, I, I think I have to mention that Isa was very bloody. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, has passed very bloody days recently, and so, yeah, just yeah. yeah. Isa is in Khuzestan. Yes. Yeah. Um, so well, we commemorate those. Uh, I mean, this has turned into a pattern now. Every day, almost yeah. there's a a fortieth uh, day anniversary of of some horrendous 
death, but um, this was kind of a big day because, as we say, Keon has become such a, a symbol of of what folks are fighting for and, and the hope for freedom and, and the youth at the center of this and the brutality of the regime. Uh, I wanted to bring something up in the... Um, Pega, you, you and I talked about talking about this because mm-hmm. it's been in the news now um, repeatedly in recent days. Now, we do have Dr. Saeed Qasemi Najad coming up who will speak to Iran's economy, and I'm sure I can ask him about this. But this ongoing conversation about the Iranian currency and, mm-hmm. and the concerns around how um, much of an economic crisis is going on. I have to confess that maybe it's because I didn't grow up there. Sometimes I, I find this very confusing. The, when people when they throw out the the U.S. dollar is now this many tumon, I, I don't I don't have a reference for what mm-hmm. that means. It's like forty one thousand. Well, what is that compared to when I do remember at the time of the revolution, the old revolution, the nineteen seventy nine one. That it was very low. It was a seven dollars, seven toman. Seven toman. Yeah. Now so it's forty one thousand. Forty one thousand. Yeah. So yeah. So that's some context. Yeah. Um, that's also forty three years. But um, so tell us what is being said right now about this uh, this Iranian currency. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm with you. Sometimes it's quite confusing for me as well because I guess the same applies. I didn't grow up there, and and um, I actually find it. I, what I find most difficult is, is this variation between Tolman and Rial, and I always get confused there. Um, so I'll preface by saying that I'm no expert on this, but What is the variation between the Tolman and Rial for oh, okay, non-Iranians so, yeah. and me? Uh, each, <laughs> yeah, each, yeah, each uh, Tolman is 10 Rial. Okay. Um, but yeah, I really wanted to talk about this because um, the currency has dropped to a new historic low. Like you said, 41,000 toman is the equivalent of one U.S. dollar. And so what this really means in terms of the effect it's having is it's contributing to um, not only the political crisis that's going on in Iran, but also an economic one. Um, there's been a 50% depreciation compared to mid-2021, which is unfathomable for most places in the world. Um, And this has a direct effect on inflation, which currently is estimated at 50%. So you see things like food prices, as you know, basic necessities that are being affected. And so um, there's so many people in Iran who are now hard pressed because of the change or rather drop in this currency. I really don't know what you can get for 41,000 toman in Iran right now, but I, I imagine it's not much. One of the things I want to talk to Dr. Qasem uh, Najad about is that uh, for those who are calling for the enforcement of sanctions mm-hmm. uh, and Im- the imposition of more sanctions, this is from the United States, um, the maximum pressure idea. Right. If the idea is to further drive the Iranian e- economy into turmoil, I'm really curious about what the end game is of that, how, how that plays out, how mm-hmm. that turns into the dismantling or the falling of the regime. I'm assuming it means something around the, the idea that you that the, the regime no longer has the ability to resource its its fear machine its military mm-hmm. and all of that um, but uh, I, I want to know uh, ask about the the the, the mechanics of that mm-hmm. um, because we've talked about this being a social and political revolution but the economy is going to play a major part Absolutely. in this and um, this is this currency thing is is uh, would be frightful at, at other times mm-hmm. in the current context it's also interesting how does this counterplay with the the revolution and a major contributing factor i mean i think like you said it, it'll be interesting to see what the mechanics of it is but i imagine it would be a large part of of potentially the fall of the islamic republic mm. now let me bring something up for the rook roundtable that uh, uh, people who've been following what's going on in the iranian world uh, will have heard today this is kind of breaking news today and in fact we don't know exactly i don't think the resolution of this but for those who've been saying there's certain types of iranian icons those inside iran that are too big you know like that are big enough that they would never get feel the repercussions Mm -hmm. about speaking out um there's some events today which prove that that's not the case. Uh, you know, we've heard this before that, you know, Tarun Ali Dusti, well, she's too famous. They won't 
they won't come and get her. They did. They arrested her after she appeared without the hijab or, uh, and other iconic figures that we've seen. In, so, so now we have the star Iranian, former uh, Iranian football player, soccer mm-hmm. player, Ali Dai, who we've talked about being like a yeah. Shajarian type, oh. type figure who's just he's a... He's a great guy until last year. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's the, he is the icon of icons in terms mm-hmm. of his stardom in Iran. Seems that today there was news that his a plane, a commercial airliner, carrying him and his family to, do, to Dubai was turned around is that yeah the idea? i don't know if he was on the plane himself i think it was just his family who was traveling oh. to dubai um and the plane was turned around and grounded in quiche and i would imagine that his family was then deplaned now we don't know what's happened since i mean we're just starting to get reports of this and there's only been early reports of, of even the, the plane being grounded but um again to your point you know the star power argument is is definitely uh well if he's not on the plane it's even worse yeah Exactly. And meaning, uh, uh, hey, pal, don't think you're going anywhere. And you're, and by the way, your family's mm-hmm. not allowed to go anywhere either. That's right. Yeah. that's And, and so right now, it's Monday, December 26th. It's the early evening when we're recording this um, in Toronto. So we only know what we know so far. We don't yes. know a lot more about this. I'm sure that there'll be more news on this in the coming mm-hmm. back hours. So if you're sitting there listening back going, I already know more about this because we don't know currently, <laughs> but uh, but harrowing stuff. And uh, also, I have to mention that a lot of I mean I, I'm talking about the c- um, cinema community in Iran because you said about Tarane, they are under a lot of pressure these days. I mean I I know this firsthand that uh, a lot of them actually they they have been threatened directly like someone goes to their place called uh, i mean zang that they they knock the door and they say like we know the address of all of your family wow. and and yeah and we will kill them don't say anything wow yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very yeah the fear campaign has certainly yeah, yeah. stepped up along with the um execution sentences and all of that. Speaking of courage, we talk about Ali Dai in, in terms of the courage he's shown to to unfailingly continue to be there speaking out against this regime from inside Iran. There's a young female Iranian chess player, mm-hmm. champion chess mm-hmm. player, uh, who has kind of kind of like the the rock climber yeah. El Naz yes. um, Rekabi. Rekabi. She has th- this chess player has um, done something brave. Tell us, tell us what she's doing. Yes, so Sara Khademoshariye. She's a 25-year-old um, Iranian chess player, like you mentioned, who actually holds the title of Iran of international master and woman grandmaster, which are very high accomplishments in the chess world. Yes. From what I understand or have read I thus far, I think international <laughs> master telegraphs that. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's I, pretty big. I didn't know just what that, you know, just how much that meant uh, until uh, I started looking into into her. But um, she was at a tournament in Kazakhstan, mm. and she actually played a game without a headscarf, not one on her shoulders, not one slightly showing her hair, but without one. Mm. And so, you know, we w- we don't know what the implications of this will be. She hasn't yet returned to Iran, but I mean, talk about bravery. Mm. By the way, this is one of those moments where uh, naive Jian, who didn't um, grow up in Iran, goes, or, you know, under this regime, goes, uh, isn't it insane that somebody goes to another country outside of Iran to play chess and has to wear that (laughs) friggin' thing on their head? (laughs) Yeah. It's pretty pretty insane. Like, they're not in Iran. Yeah, but I think that that's the the insanity behind this regime, right? That, That they think that they can instill that same fear and enforce those same ridiculous laws which um, they've done even outside the borders yeah. which yeah Over to, to a certain extent yeah. yeah they have done and that's why you know acts like this mean so much and and why we continue to be amazed by the bravery of individuals like Sara. i like the peg she's an international master <laughs> and the female grandmaster I'm told. I read that those are that that, that makes her good. It's like, yeah. what do you, you know? I don't know anything about the chess he's world. The, he's the he's the golden boot winner and and scored the winning goal in in the World Cup. I'm told that that is actually quite good. Uh, 
Um, we talk about the. We're going to be talking a, a, a couple times today, I think, about um, countries around the world, governments around the world, applying pressure to Iran, and those who haven't stepped up. And in particular, we're going to talk about the U.S. administration, the Biden administration, and and what needs to happen to get these sanctions, the ones that are even in place, enforced. Uh, and why they aren't being. We'll get to that, but I, there was some positive news over the last few days of one government and one country stepping up, and that is Germany. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Germany, uh, uh, little asterisks next to Germany, like full marks to Germany, yeah. because we, this is now a few times. Last week we were talking about political guardianships, mm-hmm. the idea of members of parliament of different um, countries around the world uh, sponsoring or becoming the guardians of those who are on death row inside Iran to help save their lives. That idea um, emerged from, germinated, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and was seen to resolution in in Germany. And now the German parliament has taken some economic measures uh, or sanctions of some kind against Iran. Yeah, so the German economy minister um, came out and gave out a statement um, where it was mentioned that they're formally suspending export credits and investment guarantees for business in Iran, as well as other economic formats. Now, I don't know what the other economic formats are, but this as a as a whole is is very very important because if you look at um you know iran german relations and trade and things like that um this is a big deal in in 2021 there was 1.76 billion euro um that was traded between iran and germany Mm. and so this is going to halt all of that it's going to suspending export credit and investment guarantees guarantees for business in iran so that does that would that be German businesses or or in Iran? I think it's it has more to do with the relationships and the accessibility of, um, let's say, Iranian businesses being able to do trade and have access to whether it's the German market or the Germans having access to the Iranian I market. I think mm-hmm. that's my understanding of it. Um, and so it cuts uh, obviously revenue for business inside Iran, mm-hmm. but also isolates Iran. Severs ties as a whole, I think, which is going to have a direct impact on on any of those Iranian businesses. Um, I think the the trade agreements or, or the um, the opening of of these um, these credits and investment guarantees and things like that happened as a result of the JCPOA discussions back in 2016, and then they were later extended. So now this suspension is going to be a huge move and going to have very very. Um, big effects on on those businesses in Iran. I mean, one hopes there's there's a lot of days where I feel like nothing important is being done. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you hear these little drips and drabs mm-hmm. and you hope, um, major drips and drabs <laughs> in this case, and you hope that they can all lead up to death of a thousand cuts. You That's know, that right. there can be, there can be a, a conflation of all of these things that drives this regime um, to hell. Mm-hmm. Right? And speaking about the German parliament, um, something else that was actually, um, I thought, really great news uh, was that 43 members of the Social Democratic Party within the German parliament demanded that the IRGC be designated as a terrorist group. So we've seen that happen, obviously, in Canada, but to see it happen in, you know, in other countries is, again, a step forward. This Thursday coming up, we have a journalist and activist from uh, Germany. Oh. Uh, on our program so we'll hear from her mm-hmm. on some of this but um, kudos to those of you uh, in Germany helping um, to enable this stuff uh, thank you thank you, uh, thank you thank Shia you. and Pega uh, we'll see you on the other side let's get to our feature guests because we have quite a show for you today and my first guest today is an academic, an activist, and a citizen journalist based in Chicago. Sana Ebrahimi was born and raised in Tehran. She moved to the United States to pursue her graduate study. She's now a PhD student and research and teaching assistant in computer science at the University of Illinois. Since the beginning of this ongoing revolution in Iran, Sana has been working diligently to amplify the voices of Iranians inside the country and raise awareness about the regime's lobby in the West. She is now administering a a group of activists working for humanitarian causes concerning Iran and right now. Sana Ebrahimi joins me from New York City today. Hello. Hello. Um, Thank you so much for having me. 
Uh, and thank you for your thorough uh, introduction. It was actually very complete. Thank you. Thank you for um, for taking the time to be on the program. Really appreciate it. First of all, uh, Santa, how how are you holding up? It, it, it occurs to me that um, even a cursory look at your social media would see that you're extremely active, um, prolific, I should say, and. Um, it, there's a, it's not easy to be looking at this stuff and dealing with it nonstop. Today, of course, is the 40th anniversary of the killing of 10-year-old Kion Pierfalak. We've heard about the execution of Yusuf Mirzavand in Desvul in prison today. How do you cope with watching and commenting on these hor- horrific events 24-7 as you seem to be doing, as well as doing your PhD? You know, it has been such an emotional time. It is very difficult to holding up and to go through daily life um, like nothing is happening. This past three months or so for me has been very, very heavy. Um, I, I feel like I'm disconnected from the world that I'm living in here in the US and I'm living in a completely different world. My priorities have changed um and it is it is like for me it's like i'm there i'm watching my home burning but there is this glass wall i can't reach i can't do anything but i can scream and i'm seeing what's happening you know i'm i'm witnessing horrifying things um but i also cannot do anything and it is very difficult every single person that i see every day on social media getting killed or getting prison for me i don't even know why but for me it feels like a family member when kian was killed i like the the entire day i was crying and i felt like my my family member my brother my younger brother was killed I felt like my families are present and that's how it feels to me. So it hits very close to home. When, when you say, and when you say my priorities have changed, what, what comes to mind? What do you mean by that? Um, so right now my first priorities, my first priority is actually this work that I'm doing because I feel like I have a platform that is able to amplify the voice of the people and the message that they're actually trying to send out. Mm. And it is also very, very um, satisfying for me knowing that I can do something because it is very painful to go through when you are far. I mean, closely, it is a different story for people who live there. But for me, talking to the loved ones in Iran, friends and family, and see the look in their eyes and not being able to do anything, it is devastating. You know, I was having known you only from watching you on social media. I was anticipating you've been a a political lobbyist or an activist for years in, in, in that very public way. Um, you're this PhD in computer science. You've done a number of degrees in, in sciences and engineering and computer science. Uh, tell me about the decision to throw yourself in the way you have um, in, in recent months to, to really make this, as you say, your priority. Yeah. So starting this, like I've been always very vocal when it comes to like political, like activism, when there is like a um, human rights issue or anything of that sort. Even when I was in Iran, I was very vocal on my social media and my Twitter account has been always public. Um, And even like when I was at school in Iran, I was very active uh, in like the protest that was going on at Sharif and things. But when I came here, um, I found out that I have like more rice, so I can use it. But then starting this revolution and seeing 
people, same age as me, or younger, go to the streets knowing that they take bullets, they're going to get shot, and they're going to die, knowing that they go anyway, that made me think, like, what are you doing? You're sitting here in the safety of your home, Mm -hmm. not being at risk of anything. Your life is not at risk. You're not losing anything. And you just, you're too afraid to just speak up. Because I was warned by friends and associates from the beginning that, hey, this is your your situation here is not stable. You are not an American citizen. You are not even a permanent resident. And if anything happens, you have to go back to that country, to Iran, and that's going to be dangerous for you. And starting this revolution, I felt like I, I don't have anything to lose. And if that's going to get me into trouble, if speaking up for this, for something that is my right, it's going to get me into trouble, let it be. Like, I don't want to live in a world that I have to shut up everywhere that I go. Because I've been, I was silenced. I was not as vocal as I wanted to be when I was in Iran. And now that I'm here on the other side of the world, I have to stay quiet because there is a possibility of danger or risk. Mm. I don't care. People are risking their lives. I'm not risking my life. You know, you 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 haven't been out of Iran that long. It's been two or three years, and when you uh, got your master's, you po- posted something uh, upon the graduation uh, with your master's degree. You said, "What a journey!" And this is just the beginning. Uh, and yes, I'm proud of myself because I'm the only one who knows what I've been through, and yet survived. Um, do Do you mind me asking you what what you've been through? What it was in Iran that you're speaking to there? Yeah. Well, um, in Iran, I mean, the general life is hard for a woman, but I was also like, um, I was raised in a family that was traditional and religious, but at the same time, like open-minded, especially when it comes to like political things, um, they're very open-minded. But yet again, doesn't matter how open-minded you are, um, the religious does its does its work. Um, I was discriminated in my family. I had a hard time to do things that I wanted to do, how I wanted to be, who I wanted to be, and like, unfortunately, at some point, um, I had to live a double life, especially after I entered the uh, into college. Um, I had to live a double life, and. It was so stressful and painful. What does it What does it mean, Sano? Double life. Um, well, I my families were religious, and they believed that as long as you are living with us, you have to respect our values and live how we want you to live, and look how we want you to look. Like, yeah, wear hijab. Um. And I didn't want to do that. I was not like that. I didn't believe in that. And well, my my older brother also had the same issue with my parents, but I was way more vocal about it. Mm. I was very vocal. Um, I was not scared. I would like disagree with them. And for that, I, well, I had to pay the price for that. I had to like, go through the fights and constant arguments that I had with my family. And at the same time, I knew that outside of home, I'm also not safe. And outside of my home, I also don't have those rights. And that was very hard to deal with. It was very difficult. Like, I heard this sentence that you shouldn't do this because you are a girl many times throughout my life. And unfortunately, from my family too. I always, so it is really hard to deal with. I always think when someone has grown up in a religious family in Iran, um, it, it, within the last few decades, within the existence of the Islamic Republic of Iran, um, that you must have some kind of interesting window into 
how this regime um, justifies itself. I mean, I know there are religious people in Iran who wouldn't equate themselves with the, these these particular mullahs and ayatollahs. But um, what do you think it taught you about this regime that you know you now so outspokenly want to see the end of by growing up in in a religious family there? I think my parents. You know, it's funny because I always told them I'm the product of your manners. You taught me to fight. You taught me to speak up. You taught me not to like accept anything without thinking. And now you are tasting your own medicine because my parents were also like that. Like my parents are my biggest role models and whatever I know, um, it comes from them. They were religious, but they were they did not believe in what the Islamic Republic represents. Um, Your dad was actually jailed by this regime, yes. right? Yes. I actually want to talk about that because, you know, I thought about this a lot. And I think at some point it must be hurt because my dad hasn't talked about it at all. But I want to talk about it here for the first time. Things that my dad has been through. And my family has been through that now I'm here and I'm speaking up. I'm the result of all of those decades of oppression. Um, well, my dad was actually, um, after the revolution, my dad was one of the first group of people who um, were like competing for like an, an entrance exam after the Cultural Revolution. So. During Cultural Revolution, the schools were closed for three years. So after these three years, there were a lot of people, a big group of people competing for schools. And the entrance exam had like two steps. It was one written and one multi-choice. And then after that, you had to go through a, an interview, an in-person interview, which had nothing to do with science. It was only to make sure that you are religious enough you are Muslim, you believe in like core values um, of the Islamic Republic. And then after that, they would go for a background check and they would research the family and background to see if you match their values. So my dad has passed like the first two steps and um, he got into chemical engineering at uh, Polytechnic University. And then he also passed a personal interview, but then they came and researched his background and his family. They said that one of their neighbors said that they uh, don't believe in revolution or Islamic Republic. And that's when my dad got rejected and got banned from school. So he was like 18 years old. It was the time to do the military service, mandatory military service. And it was right in the beginning of Iran Iraq's war. So my dad was taken to Iran Iraq's war, the front line in Bane. And like that has a full story, but after he came back, um, when he was actually engaged to my mom, um, he was kidnapped by the regime. And for a while, like family, my mom no one knew where my dad is and then after a while they found out and he called and uh, he said that he is um, arrested and he was actually um like talking about this my dad did not talk about this until i was like in middle school mm -hmm. and even that happened by accident i was like uh, flipping pages in one of his books and I saw this, like, it was, it looked, it, it was a dra drawing. It looked like a plan. And he was like, okay, here is the torture room. Here is the cell. So it was a plan of the, the like, the jail that he was in, the prison. Um, and I got curious and I asked my dad and my dad told me the story, um, uh, that like, yes, um, uh, he was prisoned, um, and, he told me about like the details of this. I really want to talk about it because 
I want everyone to know like the kidnapping, the torture, the forced confessions, these are not new. This yeah, has been happening yeah. since the beginning yeah. of the revolution. What, what, for, why was he arrested? I mean, he's this kid who's gone and fought for the Islamic Republic, uh, yeah. you know, in the Iran-Iraq war. What, what ends up getting him arrested? They were just like how you see and now they are doing, they're trying to make a fake case mm -hmm. for him because back then um, he was actually like uh, the Bani Saj that time at that time was also a very controversial um, character and um, he was like very active at his campaign um, and then he was also like generally not not pro regime and things like that but when they, he was arrested it was for something that he didn't do and in jail they were like the torture that he they they first they were trying to get him into forced confession that yeah confess that you have done this and when he didn't they started torturing him and the torture that he says he's like i was hanged from my wrist like this um, from the ceiling my eyes were covered and they were like um, lashing me with a cable and then when I would pass out from the pain they would like back me like getting conscious again and start again going through the same thing and then he was like for a second for like a very short period the eye cover went down a little bit and I could see the room it was this room that had all of his its walls and the ceiling full with blood oh. blood of the people yeah um, this is the then, this is this the 1980s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you make a really uh, important point, which is that we are so aghast uh, and horrified by the things that we see and hear about what's going on right now. Um, you know, last week I was doing an essay about how how. Um, it's it's correct that we're focusing on executions, but even those who are not executed are being kept in solitary and psychologically tortured and physically tortured, and um, so that by the time they, in some cases, leave get leave prison, they're they're not even themselves anymore. Um, but the the point that this is actually not new. This has been this regime's playbook for 43 years, the same guys who are leading this now um, were, were younger people working within this system that has learned these tricks over the years is a really important point to make. Yeah. Yes, and um, they would like bring him um, doctors for medical attention after all this torture. And even the doctor was an interrogator. So he was also trying to get him into forced confess confession and he would like give him this paper asking if, if you sign this, you will be free, you will be released if you sign this. But that was a lie because, you know, anything that you sign, it's going to go against you and it's going to be like, okay, mm. you confess to, to this, so you've done it. But my dad never confessed and eventually um, he got released because it was proven not to be guilty and uh, he was released. Um, but it was a very, it was very traumatic and I could always like when my dad talked that, um, uh, that feeling that like, oh, how much potential I had hmm. and what could my life be, but now what it is, is so different. It's like two different worlds. Um, it's like all this trauma, the accumulated trauma. And imagine like seeing this, I, I grew up um, seeing this and reading about what has been happening throughout years of Islamic Republic. So um, I had a lot of anger towards Islam. Yeah. Asana, are, are, are your parents, you, is your family, are your parents in Iran yes. um, opposing this regime now? I mean, are they part of the, the revolution? Well, they are opposed, but they are not active. But it's interesting so, to me that I, yeah. I just that's that's very interesting to me because it's important, I guess, to make a distinction between people being religious and people supporting this regime, right? Because sometimes we we can can conflate those things and go, well, if they're religious in Iran, they must be pro regime, pro Islamic Republic, pro Ayatollahs. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's actually not the case. There are a lot of uh, Muslims. Um, I mean, I have them in my family. They are oppose the regime, but um, they are religious. And they also believe that, okay, Islamic Republic is not the representative mm. of this religion. And what they're doing is not defining Islam. Islam is something different. Well, I don't believe in that. With all due respect to my family, I don't believe in that. Um, but that's what they believe. They right. believe that Islam is something else, and they are lying. Um, how did you manage to not believe in that? Um, it's, it's so. How did you defy? I mean, you're like it's like these kids on the front lines of the of the revolution inside Iran right now. What amazes me is they were born into this this system, born into this Islamic Republic, born born into this um, indoctrination. Uh, and yet they didn't drink the Kool Aid, you know. They've they've been able to to independently say, "Fuck you," you know. We don't want to be part of this. How how were you able to not buy not buy into the programming that you were born into? Uh, it is actually interesting because um, growing up, like my dad would like he had like this big um, bookshelf full of books. It was politics, religion and literature and um, my dad would talk a lot about like all these books that he's read um, like about religion and things so I was like very exposed to it and then I personally was curious so I I think I read Quran like three times with the translation so I was like I, I knew that side of it but then at some point in my life, I got exposed to the other side of the expe spectrum. And then I thought about it and it didn't really make sense to me anymore. Mm. This, this side did not make sense to me uh, because it like what it didn't, what, what didn't make sense is that they said, okay, God is very generous and is very forgiving and is very kind. But then at the same time, they pictured this horrifying hell that we're going to all go in. <laughs> um, and it didn't really add up. And then they would say, okay, God knew everything that you're going to do, but then he created you and now he's going to put you in hell right. for something that he knew you were going to do. So, so he's basically creating some creatures to put in hell and right. just watch and enjoy didn't make sense let me fast forward to today now that we've got some background on you and and um and i appreciate you telling that story about your dad that you that you haven't shared before um you know to look at you your your words and your um, your involvement in social media one thing is very apparent you are steadfastly against um, the reformists uh, in the Iranian American community, particularly Nayak, uh, you've been very outspoken about this. Why? Um, because it's done. Uh, we, as as a young generation, we had this hope. We are the generation that didn't see when the country was good. We didn't see before the revolution. We heard about it and we read about it. And then we experienced all years of Islamic Republic when we had the reformist on, uh, in the office, when we had the fundamentalist in the office, and nothing changed. For so long, we had so much hope. I was, I was one of those people. I was, it was actually the first time that I was like eligible to vote, and I voted for a reformist. And I saw the country going downhill. What was that? When did you vote for him? From that. What, what? Um, it was 2017, Rouhani. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You, you voted that, that, that recently. Yeah. Okay. And then nothing changed. Like we had, and even that time when we voted, we were like, okay, we have the worst and we have worse. Now mm. let's pick worse. And in our mind, it was impossible to like separate Islamic Republic from the country. And then we were like, the country is not going to be free. So we are stuck with these people. Now let's go for the one that is a little bit less terrible. 
But now this past years, we witnessed they were like the same, yeah. exact same. Yeah. They are the worst. Actually, I believe now the reformists are even worse because they come in a really uh, cute package, but inside they're the same evil. And nothing is going to change. Like when the whole structure is fraud, when the whole structure mm. is bad, what are you going to change? But I don't it, understand. If, if you if you went through that transformation, let me just play devil's advocate for a second here, because I've been outspoken about the reformists on this program. But if if you if you went through this transformation in uh, in in twenty seventeen, if somebody one of these people that um, that uh, you've sort of targeted as certainly unhelpful, if not enabling the the, the current regime. Uh, if that one of those people says, well, you know what, now I realize that um, uh, it's no more time. Now it's the time for revolution, even though I still have the NIAC logo behind me. Um, what do you, why should we not give them the same benefit of doubt that we would give you? First, because I'm a normal person that, I'm an ordinary person that had no power. I didn't really have like I wasn't in a position of power. I didn't have a, like a platform or media. I was not helping the government. Like I was not in that position of influence. But these people that have been in position of influence for so long, they've been advocating this ideology and they are still sticking to the same brand that has been advocating for this regime mm. for so long. I, it, it is not believable to me. And imagine, like, I was I was young. I was so young. I was unexperienced. Like, my family, actually, the ones that are older, um, even that, that term for, like, the election, they even told me that, hey, don't vote. Nothing is going to change. But I was, I, I was still, like, hopeful. Mm. I, 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 I thought... Okay, I am maybe doing something, but now I lessons learned, and I'm not gonna go through the same thing mm. again. But these people are mature, are older. They have been in position of power. Some of them still are. I think that's different. Tell me about the allocation of time and effort on your behalf to to focus so much on them. I, I mean, look, there are a lot of people who support you in this and uh, and who are, I'm sure, appreciative of you calling out NIAC, et cetera, uh, as you do regularly. There was even a an incident that happened uh, at the University of Chicago. Somebody was going to speak there and there was alleged bomb threats and you went and actually did sort of some journalistically, you know, uncovering that you couldn't find any of these threats. And, and um, But that's a lot of time and energy on your part. So um, even with a lot of people supporting you, let's say, uh, and appreciating it, when you look at your, when you take stock of, okay, how am I going to allot my energy? Tell me about that decision to be putting that time into calling out NIAC at this point. You know, uh, before all this, before all this revolution, I did not, not have sense of belonging to anywhere because I was like, okay, I don't belong to America. I was not born and raised here. I, I'm not bound to this country emotionally and legally and the country that i was born in my country does not accept me so i don't belong anywhere like where am where where do i belong where do i belong i didn't have that now since the beginning of this i feel like oh there is a place that i belong if i make it free if my country is free i belong to that country i can one day go back like imagine coming here, I knew that I'm probably not going to see my family again because I had a single entry visa and I have a single entry visa. So I was like, okay, that's it. And I had no hope. Now I'm here, I'm hoping to free my country so that one day we can all go back. Yes. So that I feel like I have a home. 
Well, there's no question about that. I mean, we, it's yeah. clear that you you believe in the revolution. Uh, it's just yeah. a matter of why, why focusing so much on the on, um, on, the, on the reformists. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm not there in the country to go on the streets, um, but I am here to fight with the people who are trying to portray a different image of the reality of Iran. Mm. And I've seen these people doing that. I lived in Iran until three years ago. And I came here, I see what they're saying, what they're focusing on. Like, whatever they say is completely different from the reality of what I lived in. Like the economy situation, like the human rights, woman rights, everything. So why not? These people have been affecting the media. They are still to this day. Yeah. They had so much influence and connection and they have been affecting media. And that causes a lot of damage. Yeah. That That is what, what, what caused America not supporting the last movements in Iran or other countries like international community not speaking up or not responding as hard as they should have in the past. Yeah. It was and, their and, fault. And to to Western years, um, either through intention or acts of omission or uh, commission, uh, this this law, this Nayak becomes then the spokespeople uh, and uh, allegedly, ostensibly representing the the global Iranian or the Iranian American uh, um, diasporic community, and they, for example, will say uh, there shouldn't be any sanctions. The, we don't believe in the sanctions. Um, and you've posted that you believe most Iranians want sanctions, except Nayak. Uh, tell me about that, and tell me what you think of the Biden administration's approach to the revolution in Iran over the last three months. So yeah, just like what you said, uh, the problem is that unlike what they say, they say, no, we are just telling, like expressing our opinion and what we think it's better. But what they actually do is selling their ideas and opinions as people's demand in Iran. But that's not true. Like, I, I think Biden administration has not yet accepted the fact that this regime has no legitimacy for the people in Iran. Like negotiation happens when a government, a regime is, it has like a minimum legitimacy for yeah. the people. How they can the Biden administration it? not know that? It's so, it's too strange for me that they wouldn't, you know, you know it, it, it seems a little more conspicuous than that to me. I mean, how, how can you at this point reject, I mean, they're saying all the right things. There's the bravado, right? Oh, we support the, the people. But um, as we just had with um, our, our previous guests talking about the inaction on enforcing these sanctions begins to get conspicuous, does it not? Yeah. Um, so like, they know it. They know, like doing doing a little bit, what I've done, the research that I've done is not even that deep because I don't have access to like secrets or secret documentation or things. All I have is like a public documentations and things that I go through. Uh, but even that surface level research that I've done, I the conclusion is that they know. They know what's happening, but what they do is just considering their own interests. So their interest comes first, and then after that, they consider it anything Wh else. Which is what? Why Why do you think, and it's not just the Biden administration, you could say this for Western governments to a certain extent in general, maybe now Germany's taking some actions that suggest otherwise, um, the, the, you know, the Canadian government's been speaking out, but I'm not sure. Why do you think they seemingly want this regime to stay in place? That is a very good question that I still don't know because right now, based on the last report that came out of, um, a, a, it was like a report to Congress that was written by a CIA agent um, about like the nuclear, like the uranium that has been enriched in Iran and how far is Iran from like, um, 
achieving the the point that can build like this um, nuclear weapons and things um they say that that's the reason we are taking it slow with them because they have enough uranium to build the weapons but they don't have the knowledge and the technology to do that and that's not gonna it's not gonna take long for them to like gain that technology Mm. um to build those weapons that's what they say it's what they claim but still what is so confusing to me is that okay you know this regime has been troubling for all the region you are also having problems with them you even say that you don't even know about the underground um, instructions that is going on nuclear instructions and is going on and might be some things that you don't know um, so all these problems and now it's iran helping russia to fight uh, ukraine you know all these things the easier option would be just helping and supporting people yeah, to topple think, this regime yeah and then dealing with the next one yeah but why are you ta- trying to deal with this troubling regime yeah this is something that i don't get well I, I, yeah i mean i suspect money or something that has something to do with it because it, it you're you're absolutely right and and many people have pointed this out on the face of it um the world will stand to benefit from getting rid of this regime. So, and certainly if they're, if, you know, the American administration and, you know, the United States stands for all the things that they say, democracy, human rights, um, liberty, freedom, etc. there's only one conclusion that one can draw. Um, and yet they're not even enforcing the, their own sanctions that, 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 that are already in place, let alone adding more of those. Um, if you're, you're in the United States, you're, active what what do you believe iranian americans uh, should be doing to help those fighting for freedom in iran right now i think supporting people amplifying their voice is the main thing that we should be focused on i don't really understand the fight that sometime is going on on social media about the next government because we are still uh, in like previous levels of Okay, let's first get rid of the, this current regime mm. and then give people the option, like the option and decision so that they can make the decision what they want to have next, because that's not our place. I feel like Iranians outside of the country, you we don't live there. So people must decide what they want. No one can say, okay, you don't want this. We don't want that. That shouldn't be here. This shouldn't be there. No, we right now all the only thing we should be focused on is supporting people and put this pressure on um the western countries to isolate the regime Hmm. in any and every way possible because unlike what nayak is trying to say they label us as warmongers unlike what they are trying to say um we don't want war and no countries actually in the world want to go in, into a war with uh, Islamic Republic like America does not want to create another war in the region mm. they don't want to get into that trouble they recently got out of Afghanistan who 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 thinks that they're gonna go back there no one wants the war but um that's what they try to say we might, but the only possible way is isolate the regime because they're at their breaking point. Like as much as they try to cover up and um, look powerful, they're not, and they don't have enough resources to keep going with this. And now what we want is that isolation to make them break. Actually, I so appreciate the. Um, the time you've given us and coming on the program today. I really do. Uh, before I let you go, let me ask you a final question. And, and you, you insinuated this where you, you spoke to it earlier 
in this chat about the feeling of not being in Iran right now. You did just leave three years ago. Um, you were active when you were there. You're much more active, um, very very publicly so now, in terms of wanting change in Iran. Do you do you feel like you wish you were there right now um, when you see? protesters in in Tehran or action on the ground there do you do you have that has um, yeah. you know that that feeling of 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 guilt or ant- or anxiety that you wish you were on the streets yes yes that's what what like uh, motivates me to be even more active because I feel guilty I uh, my therapist told me you have a survival guilt survivor guilt um because i feel like those people those young people who have been killed what is my like i don't I, i'm not better than them we're the same and i'm living here in the safety and i'm safe and i have a lot of things that they dream of and they are getting killed for it like what is the difference why shouldn't they have that and that like really um breaks me it, it really breaks my heart and it's really hard with deal with that emotional part you know because this activism needs a lot of strength um and a lot of times I, we have to deal with these emotions in private but it is very difficult Sana, thank you so much for taking the time today Thank you so much for having me. Um, it was such a pleasure speaking to you. Try to pace yourself. Don't uh, <laughs> try and get some sleep. Yeah, I try. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. This dream I'm dreaming. Won't you wake me up tonight? Cause this life I'm living. Strange dream I'm dreaming If it ain't wrong, you don't feel right Never thought you would leave me I never thought I'd have to start again This is Rook, episode 226, The Uprising. Wake up, Iranian diaspora. Wake up and raise your voice. I'm Gian Gomeshi. For all things Rook-related, go to our website, rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com. All the back issues, other episodes, all of our programming, it's all there at our website. All right, my next guest is here in the Rook studio. He is an Iranian-American engineer and social media enthusiast. Amir Nezom Samad Abadi was born and raised in Tehran, moved to the U.S. to pursue his education. He studied industrial and systems engineering at Kennesaw State University. He is a full-time engagement manager at Hewlett Packard in Georgia in the United States. But these days, he's also better known for his presence on Instagram and YouTube, where he recites poetry and Persian literature. Amir Nezam has been very active regarding the ongoing revolution in Iran in the last three months or so and has shifted his programming to that focus. And right now, Amir Nezam Samad Abadi joins me in the Rook studio. Hello, sir. Hello, Gian Azizam. How are you? Nice to have you here. Nice, nice to, to have you in Toronto. Here. Thanks for having me. Uh, you decided in the middle of um, a storm to leave Atlanta and come to Toronto. It was one of the craziest things I've ever done because... Um, you know, the, the, the planning was done, the tickets were purchased, and uh, the one thing that was not um, looked after was the weather, which is something that you don't have control over. Well, luckily, um, my flight was one of the one of the few who made it, um, but I'm here, 
And I was wondering, is the intro over? I'm getting mesmerized. Just continue the voice, the way that you articulate. Okay, Beautiful. Right. That, please, that, that, please continue. Don't try, don't try and charm me. I've seen <laughs> you do that. Uh, listen, we're going to get to the to the to the, obviously talk about the revolution. But I'm I'm so curious about you. I I've seen you. I like many people. I would assume uh, um, your videos pop up. Your mm. you know your presence in social media, and I always thought, oh, this guy, uh, he's probably in L.A. or mm. you know maybe he's in Vancouver, maybe he's in New York, mm. Atlanta. Out of all, it places. surprised me, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I I've been there a number of times. I don't think of it as a hotbed of Iranian activity. No, is it? It is not. Even though the population is around 45,000 people, the community isn't as um, united and together as in it, it is in, in the cities that you just mentioned. I mean, California obviously has a huge, huge presence. Uh, Toronto is crazy. I mean, we're driving around every single store that you see. Tehran. Daru Khan, yeah. Zahra, and then the Farsi writings. I'm like, holy, is, is, this, is this Tehran? What is it? Yes. Um, it, it's very different, and it's not. It's it's the ultimate experience for an Iranian who wants to go to a city, to not be, if you will, I mean, surrounded with as many Iranians. Hmm. You could be in a way, but um, certainly my circle isn't. That Your way. family migrated Absolutely. from Iran to yeah. Georgia. Yeah. yeah so it why was, why did they pick Atlanta? Circumstances, the way that things played out within our family dynamic and the people that we knew here, um, moved entirely. Uh, to Atlanta since 2010, to be exact, October 12, 2010. I just hit the uh, 13th year anniversary. But um, so green movement, you were in Iran. Yes, yes, I was a uh, kid. I was a kid back then. Yeah, um, I remember this this one scene. I was going to um, institute Masase um, Zabane Simin. I was learning English there since I was seven, up until. Well, yeah, I mean, mid-high school. And um, I come down the stairs, and my grandma used to come with me to drop me off at the class and pick me up afterwards. Um, I come downstairs, and then we're trying to get to the street and get in a taxi to go where, where we go. It, there was a massive crowd in the street, walking, silent. Everybody was either wearing a green shirt or anything that would show a sign of them being with the movement. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen anything like that in my life before. And um, it was an awakening moment, you know, that the people are unhappy about what they're seeing, what they're going through, and they're trying to find a way to to voice their... Although not calling for regime change at the time. Back then, no. That's changed. Back then, no. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's this there's this fear that's been broken now. And um, part of the reason that people like myself are now speaking up. I mean, stuff that we say is particularly myself. I'm not saying, I'm, you know, I'm an expert in this area or that area. But I understand pain. I see when, when something is wrong and needs change. Why do you understand pain? Huh. Someone gets pain unless they... They have been through it, right? Either on a personal level, or when you, when you, when you go through migrating to another country, discrimination, not fitting in, trying to become a, a part of a huge society culture that you haven't been a part of, mm. knowing that you had yours prior to that, but now you are forced into getting into the new world that you're in. So, I mean, all sorts of all sorts of discrimination that you can see, right? Like, if you have. Iranian or non-English speaking something on your resume, companies won't hire it's stuff like that. Even even to that point, your name, you know, you got a you got a tough last name. Mm -hmm. What do you do with it? Mm -hmm. I think the best way to to battle that is to just um, accept it, understand mm -hmm. it, and make it work. Did you like moving to the states? I mean, when you, you did one hundred percent. When you got to America and you liked it, absolutely. I was doing the math. I yeah. was thinking because you're a young guy. I think you're still. Are you, you're not even 30 yet, right? I'm 29 years 29. Old. So you've you've lived, <laughs> if I can apply my uh, ma brilliant mathematical skills to this, you've lived almost half your life in the States. Uh, yeah. And yet you yeah. you seem, I mean, to watch you on your channels, et cetera, mm -hmm. you seem pretty profoundly Iranian. Yeah. You're not one of those people who went to the States and, and nothing against this, but went to the States and, and did their best to assimilate as quickly as possible, it seems. 
I've done this math a couple of times myself and the equations make sense, but the outcome doesn't make sense. And, and, and what I that by um, essentially my circle surroundings and people around me are majority American. And that is that that was a tough decision that I made when I came here. You know, I used to see people who would come here and not adapt, not even understand the language or even try to become a part of the culture that they are in. Mm. I mean, we all pay taxes. We all contribute. We do. Why not fully take the experience and mm. become a become become a part of that society that's functioning? Right. If I wanted to continue to the, the way that it was in Iran, well, I would have stayed there and I would have just lived my life, even though I truly, truly believe you are more Iranian when you're not inside of Iran. There are things that keeps you awake at night. Mm -hmm. You think about those beautiful memories that you, that you had. I don't know if you if you remember this. There, there was a plastic ball that we used to play in the streets of Iran. We would play soccer with that. I see that I cry. Mm -hmm. That, but if I was there just because of you know proximity and always having those resources available to you, you don't value it as much. Right, right, right. But then you the, get a perspective after you leave. Hundred percent. What you love about the place, yeah. Even though my surroundings and, 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 and people that I hang out with, the work that I do is 100% is American. When I get on these um, platforms and I talk or when I do my own videos, it's almost as if I have never left Iran. Mm. You know, so like in, in a setting like this, when we sit down and talk, people do expect me to like know exactly everything that's going on. They just don't know that this is a pure love for poetry and Persian literature and just the readings, the dialogues. Well, the you're stories. also completely, I mean, beautifully fluent in English. But you started your podcast, mm -hmm. your your social media work, right. your YouTube work in Persian. Yes. So that goes back to 2012. Longing again, pain, right? In Iran, in our in our Adabiyat Farsi class, I'll be that kid that the teacher would pick up on me and say, "Hey, um, we used to read the." The chapters page by page mm. and then they would take turns all right Ali start reading you pick up two reasons right just to get through the text and that chapter and two the teacher wanted to see who's paying attention by following the text I would always be that kid to get called on a lot because I would read fast I wouldn't waste time I would read as correctly as I could mm. and um, I would put the emphasis where it needed to go so that one teacher of mine, whom I, I, I love dearly and I have not heard or talked to since I have left, um, kind of pushed me towards this direction. You know, mm. um, people's person, ener energy, personality, wanting to speak properly, understanding what you're saying. I, 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 abs I did the same thing with English as well. Like people think that just you sit down and you watch a reality show or whatever. I would take notes, Jian, like pause go back take notes just to be able to do it the right way in the american way you know what i mean hmm. i wanted to truly become a part of this you didn't society. just learn it from friends no no <laughs> no i did the, not the, the great beacon of uh, english uh, no. language teaching the, the friends back back episodes of friends it, it it's interesting to watch you because you um it occurs to me that you um, are an artist or you at least appreciate yourself as that you you look into the camera you do this poetry you have mm -hmm. your voice you mm -hmm. you're quite dramatic you have a flair for performance um, and um, and yet systems and industrial engineer oh my god don't, so, don't even begin i'll start is crying. that is that the persian kid who uh even when he comes to the states yeah. can't possibly uh go into the arts without his engineering degree at first Yes, um, not even an engineering degree. It's a, it's a career. I mean, you're it is a career. you're at a big company in Atlanta. Yeah. It is it is a career. But um, um, I I think if time would have gone back, and if I were to do it all over again, being in the U.S. Um, with all the love and respect and understanding I have for education, I truly do believe our education system is failing us at every level. And personally, it's just a in a which country in particularly the u.s uh -huh. it's you know that there's there's a lot of corrections and things that needs to happen to it for it to be what it should be hmm. we're wasting a lot of time you know you're getting you're getting you're getting a degree in industrial engineering or any kind of an engineering for that matter 
why are you consuming four four years of my life to teach me a whole bunch of nonsense that I don't even need to know? Why would I sit in, a, in an uh, economics class in front of a, a, a professor that has tried entrepreneurship at some low level, opened up a Subway restaurant, failed miserably, and now you're talking to me about inflation? You're trying to talk to me about opportunity cost? Let me go ahead and find that out on my own. Mm. But when it comes to when it comes to real things that has consequences the long way, if you don't learn it the proper way, teach me those things. So the four year period could be could be shortened to to sixteen months, eighteen months. Let me get to it's just it's just all a, a money making machine that I think has a, has a lot of room for for corrections. Mm. But industrial engineering again, yeah. Um, I mean, do you have a passion for industrial engineering? The analytical side of my brain mm. appreciates it. Mm. Not not much of the emotional side. Even though even though being able to be a good industrial engineer or engage in manager or be a part of, you know, a pre-sales or sales organization of any com- company, you have to understand people's and emotions, right? Mm. And and I I believe the main reason that I chose Mandisi Sanaye is because you have to be able to work within a group of people who are focused but instead of working in a lab and and having you know a computer in front of you glasses on typing your life out on your keyboard you're trying to solve issues mm. right like like improvement how can i do this better how can i improve this how can i be more efficient do you um you're still doing that job full 100%. time 100% do you yeah. is does it feel like a split personality like a it engineer is. by day podcaster by Man. night uh, or uh, i mean it, it, it <laughs> do is you tough. put on a different um, shirt to, to and, and no no i mean really uh, it's a because first of all it's 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 quite something to manage just the um um the emotions of this mm. this moment and everything that that is happening for Iranians and then to be on the front lines of that speaking about it uh in social media etc et right. to be doing that Part time while you do your all your engineering work, I'm I'm it's curious about time. managing that. I mean, what we just passed the hundredth day. Um, I've told this to many friends before. I feel like a zombie. Mm. You know, you 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 get on you get onto your computer, you log in, you do the things you got to be doing, but um, nobody knows what you're going through. Nobody understands you. Your coworkers at Hewlett Packard in Atlanta. You, um, they might be sympathetic, but they really extremely can't. Extremely loving, caring people, yeah. and they. Uh, you can't even. Well, here's the thing again: political correctness. What to say? If, if if I say, will I get in trouble? Is there going to be support coming up from the higher up? Are they going to ever talk about it? Should I talk to them about it? If I do, what are the implications? What's going to happen? Um, no, it's it's. My team has been extremely supportive. Uh, loving, caring, and they have extended the the hand of help if if needed, and they've said anything you need, um, emotionally, time wise, whatever. Let us know we're here for you. Um, but it's so hard, man. You got you got you got a conference call at eleven. Accidentally, you you get on YouTube, you see something from these news outlets. You're shattered, but you got to get into a call and start talking about the normal stuff that you talk about. You hang up, you gotta continue on your tasks, but your people are dying. And there's nothing you per se can do. Can do about it. Right. So like this is this is why I'm saying the importance of unity and us coming together from from any walk of life that we have ever been on, there needs to be a single focused vision. And that's the freedom of our country at any cost. Well, before this period, well, you've been, um, as I understand it, the imperative for you doing these, you do um, interpretations of Mm -hmm. Persian poetry, Persian literature, uh, and you've done that as a way of fostering connectivity for for all of us and and the homeland. Is that the, was that the idea? The main, the main reason for that was, I feel like. You know, when you and I are having an interaction, sitting here, talking to each other, mm-hmm. after knowing somebody for so long, or even not knowing them for so long, when something goes wrong, you know either Jian did something wrong or Amir Nazam did something wrong, but they didn't pay attention to it. The emotions, like, 
I could have done better. I could have handled myself better. There's a better way that I can just by talking about the stories that I talk about, bring the importance of the, even though minutia, but extremely important. Like we, we remember how we made each other feel. Mm. And sometimes I feel like we get, we get so lost in this, at least in the US, the capitalistic concern that we have, like bigger boats and bigger homes and uh, luxury cars. And we lose touch of what actually matters. And, and what actually matters. Kindness being genuinely kind to each other, being there for each other when when we need each other the mm. most. Help, support, you know what I mean? At, at my deathbed, when I'm 80, 85, 90, whatever, I'm not gonna sit and say, oh, I wish I did that contract and I won that. And I, you're like, I wish I spent more time with my mom, with my dad. So wait a second, what does that have to do with your, the Persian literature and poetry? A lot of the stories, so if, if you really like look uh -huh. closely and, 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 and see where the emotions are coming from, they're trying to say, um, they're explaining these little details and importance, important things just by using the stories. Like, Jian was a kid, and Jian had that experience when he was little. He mm. grew up, da, da, da. Saying all that to say, it's important to spend time with. Mm. You know what I mean? Whether it's poetry, whether it's short stories, dialogues, movies. Um, um, yeah. I saw yeah. I saw you. Uh, I don't know if it was an interview or something. Somebody was saying, "What?" Or you were answering the question, "What is? Um, what keeps you going? Or what's the reason to to live? What's the reason to survive?" And you said, "Family first, wow. and then um, hope for better better days." Yeah. I think you said that all of that before. The, the killing this, of Massa, yeah. but uh, but I suspect the answer wouldn't be that different now, would it? I'm gonna cry. It's so painful. Every single thing that was said in that video, any any time before that, when you talk about like specifically us Iranians, um, it seems like this one bad thing that's bothering all of us keeps bothering all of us and the stuff that you say four years ago on your social media about the killings or injustice we are just rinsing and repeating the same old stories mm. so you're correct i did say it back then it still applies to today it's still it it's sad that it's still around you know at one point i do want to change and make that shift and talk about other things but there's this big, massive thing that's stopping us from going forward. It's a pretty big, massive thing. It is a pretty yeah, big, massive yeah. thing, and I'm, I'm in, I'm in no position to talk about it strategically. But I do know that there are people who have devoted their entire lives into studying these things: mm -hmm. dictatorship, how to get to democracy, what are the strategies, how can you leverage power, what are the strategies when you're talking about war, how do you deal with this specific oppressive regime or f for that matter regimes as such in the history right we have to sit down and study these sometimes sometimes due to certain events that we we go through in life we become intentional this is that time of becoming intentional in the iranian community well that's a good segue because one of the things that you've said and I assume, and, and and you're you're living by it in terms of shifting your focus to a certain extent, if if there's any shifting that was necessary, to what's going on in in Iran right, right. now in terms of the revolution. Is um, you posted a video, I guess, it, it, in mid November, talking about the importance of not remaining silent. Yes. Um, tell tell me tell me about that. I mean, a lot of us have been saying this. Right. I just did an, another essay about it. You know. Um, but but for those of us in the diaspora, for mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. sitting in Atlanta, doing a even even though you're doing a podcast with Persian literature and poetry, right. why is it important for you to not be silent about what's going on in Iran right now? It is my country. It's it's something that's happening to me and my people the effects of it is going to stay around 
way longer than I'm going to be around. And if I don't do anything about it right now, whether it's one video or doing a translation of this PDF that you know is extremely crucial for the masses to start understanding and digesting, if you don't do that, you haven't done your part. I truly believe talking about things that are not normal has to become a norm. We have to fight against the things that are not normal. And we have to make him go away. Go away. One of the massive things that I do notice is, obviously, 17 years, Iran, then moving, all that. Think about it this way. I see, I see the Iranian Americans who are born here mm -hmm. more crazier than us in fighting for this movement. They have not stopped. At times we have felt tired. It is completely normal to feel tired. Mm. But those kids that I see still today, I mean, I'm like, could you take a break? Well, it's I would count myself amongst that. I mean, I was born in London. I've, I've no, I didn't grow up in Iran. But uh, first of all, I feel that profound connection to Iran. Right. And second of all, I do feel that moral responsibility um, to to do something. Right. It's my homeland. It's where my both my parents are from. It's where my family still is in Iran. It's everything I know cultural, uh, and um, and all of our lives. Yeah. And remember that th there's a sometimes there's a bit of a um, I think a misjudgment from those who've just come from Iran mm -hmm. uh, who say, well, you know, we've been living under this thing. You right. know, uh, what do you know about it? And and Oh, they don't, what they don't realize is that those of us in the diaspora have been living with this same thing for oh, yeah. for f 43 years, not being able to visit my family. Right. I've never seen, you know, I haven't seen certain family members for ever or, right. or for, you know, uh, since I was a little kid in Iran. I mean, that's it, right? right. So, um, so uh, it, it, not to mention the trauma, the, the, the background, the, the mm. discrimination, all of those mm. things that uh, that happen for all of us. So it, it doesn't actually surprise me that those in the diaspora who've been here for decades, I get your point, but it doesn't surprise me that they're that they're rising up, you know, and right. with such a passion. Last week we had somebody on the show named Massa Townsend. She's she's been active in, in social media recently and she's posting these passionate videos and stuff. And uh She's been in, in the U.S. since she was 10, like for 40 years or something, mm -hmm. and kind of suppressed her Iranian side. And the vigor and the emotion and the passion with which she's now, yeah. you know, uh, on social media is so telling. It's yeah. like it's coming out of her. You know, it's always been there. Mm -hmm. But she's like, fuck this, you know, I, I need to I need to exercise yeah, Do this. something about it. Yeah. yeah. In a way, you're, you're saying it spot on. I was hiding my Iranianness. We talked about fitting in, right? Coming here, U.S. We know, we know the history, what mm -hmm. has happened, mm -hmm. hostage crisis, all that. We had to hide our Iranianness, you know. And um, I, ca I can only, I can only imagine, you know, a, a kid who's born here goes to Iran. They have to hide their Americanness. Right. This is something actually a good friend of mine talked about, and it makes so much sense. Yeah. Now you are proud to yell for, for your veins to kind of come out of your neck and say, hey, I am Iranian I'm, and I'm fighting for my beautiful country. Enough yeah. is enough, yeah. right? But we, we each of us, and, and going, going back to your question, saying why am I doing things like this right now? Imagine <clears throat> what you're doing yourself. If one person who had never seen this side of you that comes out and talks about, hey man, something is wrong. It's my homeland. I know that my focus ha has been X, Y, Z in the past. Until an unknown time, till this thing goes away, my entire being, mm. existence, focus is going to be put on contributing in a positive way to this movement in order for it to get to mm. an end. Mm -hmm. I need to see this light at the end of the tunnel. Not only I see it, I need to get to it. Enough is enough. Do you judge those who are silent? I don't. 
It's well, hard. Why not? It's hard. I mean, I'm, I, I'm hard. confused about it myself. It's hard. Whether I, I see friends who are, you know, posting fun pictures at the Christmas tree and, and Iranians. You no, know, and, you can be. And I sort of go, okay, what should I... Um, feel good that they're able to compartmentalize or, or feel angry that they're not speaking out or you know I, these are questions that I'm I'm struggling with what where's what, question what for do you, you. Think? We, we, we talked about it last night question for you I mean Azam has a personal page that has um, mostly his American friends in Jian probably has the same what good would me posting on my personal page with all the Iranians Ammez and Da'iz and Khalez we all know what the issue is mm -hmm. right what kind of a good or awareness would that bring to my immediate circle or people that I know who already know what the issue is and by among, like just by talking about it amongst ourselves that's not gonna, that's not going to solve anything so the global attention does which I have not done anything on anything anything personal of mine I feel like I do have a platform that I can use and it it could reach a little bit like a b bigger audience than my normal page mm -hmm. and I'm putting that to use however not to get derailed mm -hmm. think about it this way the actor the singer the artist whoever that person is in Iran there's a massive control over them Jian. they can't just threats I'll kill your kid what are you gonna do are you gonna what, what's more important are you you know what I mean mm -hmm, you can't even mm -hmm. understand it until you're put in that position mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so as you can see one by one the ones who can are coming out and leaving and talking about it mm -hmm. and they're listen it's not as easy as you think it is you get threatened you get threatened well that's to, a different thing right that's a different thing when you question about what the what's the what does it what purpose does it have in the echo chamber of your Iranian circle to keep repeating this stuff, right? Some of them think by them doing it on their personal pages, mm -hmm. it won't go anywhere. Who's going to see it? Well, I, are you gonna I, I disagree with that, actually. Mm -hmm. Or I disagree with you. I'm not sure if you're, go for you're it. saying that. Uh, because, uh, look, I think there's information and there's affirmation. Information is certainly important at this time. Mm -hmm. So, So to keep um, people abreast of what's going on, you know all those sayings of um, "be our voice," uh, "say his name," "say her name." This person is on death row. Save a life. Say their name. That's all about information. Let's keep keep this information out there. And and affirmation is the is normally a bad thing, I think, in social media and in, in a lot of ways, which is that people go into their bubble in their echo chamber and uh, all the Trump lovers are in one echo chamber mm -hmm. and all the you know left-wing liberals are in another echo chamber and they never meet and they never talk to each other and all of that. But in this case, I think affirmation is not a bad thing for us to continue just the same way we do when we're on these demonstrations, mm -hmm. to continue, you know, patting each other on the back, continue locking arms, continue looking each other in the eye and going, we're in this together, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. So when I see my friends doing that, I don't I don't roll my eyes and go, yeah, I already know about Keon Perfilak, you know? I go, okay, that, you know, we're continuing to make sure that we're all on side and take that, you're right, if we don't take it to the broader community and if we don't, you know, if there is no uh, action out of that, mm -hmm. then it could just be uh, an exercise in navel gazing, and just you know, circular um, uh, talk. But uh, but but to really um, continue to affirm each other mm -hmm. that this is the path and that we've all got to be in this together, right. I think that's really important. And some of us don't have bifurcated social media. I don't actually have a personal secret thing and then a, a, a public thing so so when I'm uh, posting stuff uh, I know that there's non Iranians looking at it as well but right. but I, I I think my Iranian friends should be checking this stuff, stuff out too that's a fresh perspective that I actually do respect so um, we should continue in any way we can any any way we can this How? can't this can't die down you, you, know? you, you wrote uh, you don't want to go any further with that. <laughs> you, you, you didn't want to you didn't want to take me I'm on agreeing on that one. to agree yeah, yeah. look I'll you agree to agree you you wrote um good weeks good months good years are finally coming there was an analogy of a bus mm -hmm. you did this in persian i'm sorry i'm using the english a translation good, a, good, a good friend of mine wrote it oh a good friend yeah, of yours yeah. okay okay our good 
day's bus can be seen from afar, our good day's bus finally arriving at its destination. Yeah. Um, t- tell me about that. Tell me how you're feeling. Do you, do you, uh, because, you know, we vacillate between that feeling of, you know, there's people dying, there's, yeah. there isn't millions of people in the streets. Uh, is this a pipe dream? And that feeling of no, hatsman in that fear, it's right. happening, it's just a matter of days, weeks, months. Where are you at on that? <clears throat> I've heard you say this before, and um, I think it's very true. This is, this, is not a, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. And the ones who have done marathon, they know, they know it takes patience. You have to build up to it, the resistance. Um, we are building up that resistance. This is something that none of us have seen, at least myself. The mm. ones that are here, we, we are learning how to deal with them. It's just like being given a whole bunch of cars and now you have to deal with it, right? Figure out the way forward. I really think outside of the, the main, oh, we'll do this, we have to become strategic. We have to sit down. I hope behind doors, behind the closed door, people are already doing this. If not, we are in a bad, bad, bad spot. Meaning this uh, unified uh, opposition? It's a, of- ga- it's a game of chess. It's something that you've got to have a clear strategy, have a clear vision. Know exactly when your enemy is going to get dismantled with what strategy and how. We haven't, I hope the, exper- the experts are doing this. Mm. I can do so much. You can do so much. We can talk about it. We can bring awareness. Um, Angelina Jolie can get on board for two seconds on a story in that France all great. Mm-hmm. There needs to be. You're saying we're not the experts? How dare you? Uh, it, <laughs> maybe you are. Um, <laughs> no, I know. I, uh, um, it, it takes a lot more, my friend. And, and, and becoming intentional with it, right? At some points in our lives, we, we, we become intentional with the things that we do. This is that time for us Iranians to become intentional with educating ourselves, even, even at a basic level, to understand the cause of a dictatorship. Sorry, this is the time. To this a, is yeah, the time. Intentional. Right? This, see, yeah. this is the time to be mm-hmm. intentional. Yes, I mean... Um, you want to read Fifty Shades of Grey, get 20 minutes on a Sunday, go for it. But you cannot ruin your entire week. Mm. Read the stuff that matters. Do the things that matter. Educate yourself. Network. Surround yourself with the people who are going towards the right direction. And try to contribute as much as you can in any shape or form that you are capable of doing based on your cap- capabilities and, and talents. Mm. Put them to use. This is the time to put things into use, man. And yes, as I if the if there isn't a revolutionary spirit emanating out of Hewlett Packard in Atlanta, <laughs> I'm going to be blaming you because I expect you to be you know stirring things up there. A, a final question, Jim. I'm really, I'm really nice to have you here in the studio. Pleasure. This, Thank um, you. Um, you you have a big audience. Uh, I'm sure you hear from them. I'm sure many of them are in Iran. Yeah. Um, share with me something that comes to mind that has really moved you that you've heard from somebody in the audience recently. Um, the second time, I'm, 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 you're making me cry. I I found out that Gina Amini had dreams of becoming a um, an anchor. Um, Guyande loved being in front of the microphone and talking, right? When I heard that voice, you wouldn't believe. I was scared to go into my DMs, type in her name, and see that there has been a DM from her in the past that I have not gotten to. Never did it, not going to do it. Just the connection that had been there, something that I'm doing, and people seem to like it and something that she wanted to do so not knowing someone but you feel this Mm -hmm. bond you feel this desire you feel this something that puts you in the same category Mm -hmm. i broke down in tears 
that um, that was probably a very emotional moment for me just because of what I do. And in, the, in addition, you, you receive a lot of messages of saying, hey, we had seen all other sides of you, the focuses that you had put on on different topics and to see you standing up and being by our side and and not just not being indifferent. You're in the US, you probably don't have the issues that we have, da, 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 da. This is giving us a great feeling. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for making me move. Thank you for energizing me. Mm. I want to get out. I want to do something. I want to speak up against something that's wrong. Let's let's make it right. I'd like to end with a, with a, with a tiny little poem, if that's please, okay. If please. you would, yeah. um, if you want to do your closing till I find it, um, let's go ahead. Closing. <laughs> yeah, we're we're we'll wait for you. All right. جیان عزیزم کتابی ام سوکی فدرن فارسی خب از ترجمه شده به نام آکورد آزادی از ویکتور خارا ترجمه دوست بسیار خوبم بابک زمانی تلخ این رو گفتن اول کتاب نوشته برای جینا کتاب رو تقدیم کرده به جینا و بعد از هزار نسخه اولی که اومده بیرون اجازه چاپ این کتاب ندادن یعنی چاپ دوبارش رو جلوش رو گرفتن آم، چیزی که داشتم بهش نگاه میکردم و فکر میکردم که فیتینگ باشه برای امروز بریم با هم دیگه فقط صفحاشیم و هم وره بگانه دور راین میگه برخیز و به دستانت نگاه کن دست برادرت را در دست بگیر اکنون می توانیم ببالیم ما همه از یک خونیم ما همه با همیم آینده می تواند از امروز آغاز شود یک سرود آن دم معنا می آبد که زربان سطورش محکم باشد و با آوای مردی خوانده شود که برای آوازش جان دهد مردی که خالصانه آوازش را فریاد زند گیتار من برای دشقیمان نیست که حریص پول و قدرتند گیتار من برای دستان زحمتکش مردمانی است که عرق میریزند تا فردای من را شکوفا کنند مردم متحد هرگز شکست نخواهند خورد مردم متحد هرگز شکست نخواهند خورد به پاخیز و سرودی بخوان پیروزی از آن ماست ببین چگونه پرچمهای همبستگی برافراشتهاند تو نیز در این راه به من خواهی پیوست و سرود و پرچم تو نیز شکوفه خواهد داد روشنایی سرخ سپید دم خبر از زندگی پیش رو می دهد This can go longer but I will stop here Thank you Jim Beautifully done for me Thank you for being here Much love never changes remains a stupid lie it's never been quite the same no hearing or breathing no movement no color just silence the rise and fall of shame search that shall remain we asked you what you This is Rook episode 226, The Uprising. 
Let's go back to New York City for my next guest. He is an Iranian-American financial economist, sanctions and compliance expert, Dr. Saeed Qasemi-Najad is a senior advisor and financial economist at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, specializing in Iran's economy and financial markets, sanctions, and illicit finance. He was born and raised in Iran. He obtained degrees in engineering and finance in Iran and France and received his doctorate in finance from the City University of New York. His works have been published in prestigious publications such as the Wall Street Journal Foreign Policy, the Jerusalem Post, the National Post, the Weekly Standard, and the Washington Post. And right now, Dr. Saeed Qasemi-Najad joins me from New York today. Hello, sir. Hello, and thank you for having me. Thank you for being on, Saeed. Uh, um, I want to have this, as I've been saying on the show, sanctions conversation with you, and I can think of no one better in terms of your expertise. But uh, it occurs to me that you are the finance PhD guy who's seen in these impressive media hits, but you have your own personal experience with this uh, dreaded Islamic Republic regime in Iran. As I understand it, you were a student activist at the University of Tehran and ended up being arrested and imprisoned by the IRGC. Is that correct? That's right. At the time, I think I was 20 years old. Uh, and I was actually going to see my dad, who was in hospital. And at the time, there was student uprising uh, in University of Tehran and other universities. And so a few people came to they had guns came came to, into my car. I was driving the car. Two of my friends were, were with me, and they actually took me with my own car to, to the Evin prison. So I spent some time there. Not a very pleasant experience. I think I was there for for four months. And after sorry, you had, were in Evin for four months? No, for for for, for one one month. For one month. Uh, yeah. And uh, after that, I had to deal with the with the court process. Uh, with actually Judge Salavati, who is known as the hanging judge. He later got uh, sanctioned. I played a role in that, so I was quite happy about that part. And then, yeah, I um, I, I left Iran in 2008, and uh, in 2012, I came to the to, to the United States. Does, does that experience, I mean, I have to think that that experience, what you went through, and everything that we hear these days about um, torture, psychological torture, etc., solitary confinement, uh, the way that uh, prisoners um, uh, these days for just those who are protesting, um, what they're going through. I have to imagine your own experience informs or colors your passion for wanting to do something about this. Absolutely, and I have to say what I've been through was much lighter than what people right now are going through. Uh, at the time, uh, I think the regime had more um, confidence. Uh, so their use of like the physical violence was less. Uh, right now, the news we hear, it's really very brutal. Like it's, it's un unimaginable. Uh, what we what we hear right now, I think, and it's because the regime has lost his confidence. As Khamenei said recently, they are going back to the god of the eighties, the Chodoy Da That's 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 interesting and almost seems paradoxical. As the regime loses its con confidence, uh, in your view, it becomes it becomes more brutal. It becomes more violent because more and more it can only rely on violence. It doesn't have the support of any segment of society besides the small percentage of society which are which believe in its ideology. So the rest of the society is against it. So as a result, they have to use more and more violence. And is it your sense that that violence is is meeting with efficacy at present? So. <clears throat> It's, it's really brute force. So as you, as you saw, like as you hear what, what's happening in prison, as you see the videos of the, uh, what's happening in Iran, violence, so usually it's efficient in the short term, but uh, in the long term or medium term, you are pushing more and more people to oppose you. 
And what we have, what we are seeing right now in Iran, it has been like three months. So for three months, people are standing against this. So it hasn't worked. It, it has kept the regime in power so far, but it hasn't worked to put down the protest. And we need to understand this protest in the context of the waves of protest that we have since, since 2017, which all of them have been revolutionary. And one thing they have in common is that all of them want to the fall of the regime. And every time the regime uses violence to put it down, it doesn't mean that it doesn't erupt again. It yeah. erupts after a few months, after a few years. And I should say that, uh, I mean, we, we regularly point this out, but it, it must be very interesting from your position to see this. If 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 the student um, activism that you're talking about, if the if the protests that you're talking about that you were involved in are were they the 1999 student protests at University of Tehran? No, it was 2002. Okay, 2002. It was a smaller one. But at that time, surely you weren't saying you weren't calling for the end of the regime. I mean, you might have wanted it, but people were not saying that in the streets that, that they the way they have been this year, right? Yeah. So at that time, the political discourse was set on reform. So uh, we have a paper, I have a paper on that actually. So in 2017, it was a year of the structural break in Iran's political discourse. So you have a, finally people are, you have a transition from reform to revolution. After years of trying uh, to reform the regime, Finally, the Iranian people, majority of them, decided that the regime is not going, is, is not reformable. Yeah. So that's why since 2017, every time people come to the street, every chance they get, whatever the trigger is, sometimes the trigger is economy, sometimes the trigger is like this time, uh, social, social liberty issues. Quickly, it moves to a political demand. And that political demand, which is common among them, is the key slogan of the Islamic Republic. Yeah. I, I feel like this is still, um, you would think after weeks and weeks of this, uh, that the message would be sent. But I, I feel like this is still sometimes lost on the Western media that will say this is a the protests continue in Iran about this sort of one thing as opposed to um, recognizing, acknowledging, and and uh, informing the, the general public that this is actually, uh, the people are actually calling for a change of regime. That That's true. I always tell policymakers and journalists, if you want to see what people want, the best way to understand it is to go and listen to the slogans what they are chanting. They came to the street, they are really risking their lives. So they say what's important to them. And if you actually go and gather the data, it shows that the slogans are really focused on the regime's existence. They don't want the regime. You have like slogans that are targeting different foundations of the regime's existence in foreign policy that uh, famous slogan of no to Gaza, no to Lebanon, my life only for Iran, that really targets the, the foundation of the regime's foreign policy. You have people chanting that they are very <clears throat> disappointed or they chant their regret about the 1979 revolution. You have, you have people chanting the name of the, the Pahlavi, whether it's Reza Shah, Muhammad Reza Shah, or the Crown Prince Reza Pahlavi. So these are all the slogans that are targeting the regime's foundation. And if, if you are a neutral person, if you just go and gather the data, it's really difficult to miss what people want. Let me, um, that's perhaps a good segue to talking about um, how we can affect those slogans from the outside of Iran, and particularly when it comes to policy, um, particularly when it comes to the superpower of the United States where you're sitting right now, and particularly when it comes to sanctions. So you wrote a piece last month that begins this way. Let me quote you. The Biden administration's failure to fully enforce its sanctions against Iran is helping the Islamist regime in Tehran survive an unprecedented challenge to its authority. Um, Said, let me take that one step at a time. First of all, what are the sanctions that currently exist that are not being fully enforced? 
Look, we, especially during the previous administration, you have really a very comprehensive regime of sanctions. Almost everything at the industry level, at the macro level, everything that's important has been sanctioned. Sanctions, however, it's a cat and mouse game. So you sanction, they go find a way. You need to close the, those gaps. So the Biden administration is not doing that. For example, we, the regime is selling, exporting 1.2 million barrels of, uh, of oil per day. That has, that has been down to 700,000 barrels per day. It, it's doable. So you see the same thing in the non-oil export. I'm like sorry, the, the oil is being sold to China mostly, right? That's correct. So how do U.S. sanctions affect that? So China wants to trade with, with, the, with the United States. That's what they want. Mm. So if you are, uh, if you go to them and let them know that this is unacceptable, and after that you enforce your, those sanctions uh, strictly, anyone who is involved in that, any company that's involved in that, you sanction them no matter where they are, no matter who they are. That sends the message to people in China, to the Chinese government, that this isn't acceptable. And if they get that message, the Iran's export to China would go down. Hmm. So, how is how is Iran's success in acquiring hard currency and financial financial resources related? to the Biden administration's decision not to endorse existing U.S. sanctions and, Im and impose new ones? I, 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 have, I want to say something else, one more point about the sure, sanctions. Sure. Look, on the oil specifically, we know where the oil comes from, where which tankers are taking that oil to work. And uh, during the Trump administration, the Trump administration actually tested whether these tankers can be confiscated and it worked so option two in addition to what i said is just to go these are because these are illicit uh, oil experts go and confiscate these tankers sell the oil in the market use and then when we come back when we go to the maximum support strategy that we are suggesting use that revenue to help Iranian protesters. So the Biden administration uh, policy right now, it's really uh, difficult to understand for me because even if they don't want to help the revolution, even if they just want to have a deal with this regime, if you don't have any leverage on the regime, if the regime is selling its soil, it has money because your only leverage uh, beside the mili military threat is, is the fact that you have these sanctions, they right, are in bad position. Right. So if you don't enforce the sanctions, how do you want to convince them to come back to the table, have a negotiation with you, have a deal with you? Sorry, can I can I ask a naive question? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that this is a, a legit question, but, but wouldn't confiscating tankers be an abrogation of some kind of international law? It hasn't been so because we had, uh, the previous administ administration did it, Right, and nothing happened because ni neither Iran nor China they accept that this oil is going from Iran to China. Just that specific tank oh. I'm talking about. So if you go get them, they really don't make a big deal of it. Iran actually, what Iran does is that they go and then uh, you know confiscate tankers from I don't know South Korea or Japan or things like that uh, in response. But okay. then if you have a, you know, if you <clears throat> let the Iranian, the Iranian, the Islamic regime understand that this is not acceptable, if you have a threat of use of force there, they, they won't do that. They are testing the water whenever they can get away with that, they do it. But when they cannot get away with that, like what happened with Soleimani, right? Then they don't, uh, they don't respond uh, in a forceful way. You also point out that the majority of Iran's non-oil exports um, are also sanctioned goods, such as petrochemical, steel, 
oil products, and that last year Iran's non-oil exports reached their highest value at around $48 billion. Why, why are these sanctions not being enforced? Oh, that's a good question. I really have no idea I, uh, why the Biden administration is not enforcing them. To be fair, these are more difficult to be to enforce, like the petrochemical. It's not as easy as oil sanctions to enforce because petrochemicals, so they you, you repackage it. Most of these are going to UAE, Iraq, and Turkey, and they are being repackaged and then they, uh, they, are, they are being sent to the third country. But still it's doable. So you just need to uh, use some more uh, intelligence asset. You need to have a larger team to follow these things. So it's doable, but it's more difficult than oil. Oil is pretty easy. Hmm. You see where, where they are, where they go. So, so let me circle back to the the um, economy and this this question of how how is Iran's success in acquiring hard currency and financial resources related to the Biden administration's decision not to endorse these existing U.S. sanctions and or to impose new ones? So when you when you don't enforce these sanctions and you don't ex- expand sanctions, uh, and actually sell this oil then it, it's easier for Iran to repatriate this money, uh, either in form of the hard currency or in form of goods. And that actually erodes our, the U.S. leverage over Iran. So it's a bad policy whether you want to help Iran in revolution or whether you just want a nuclear deal with them. So it's kind of, um, I mean, to state the obvious, despite the bravado of some Western leaders, including um, the Biden administration, uh, supporting the the brave people of Iran in this fight for freedom, etc. Um, business, to a certain extent, is continuing as usual, and the regime is making money. That that's right. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, I have to say that the German the German government recently uh, took a good step. Uh, in suspending uh, the, um, some 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 uh, facilities that it provides to tr- trade with Iran, but be, be, beyond that, I haven't seen anything. Most of sanctions, ninety nine percent, are focused on uh, human rights violators, which is good, but it really doesn't uh, add that pressure on the regime. Okay, so let me help me understand this at the same time. We hear a lot, notwithstanding what you've just said, we hear a lot about the Iranian economy being under duress right now. Like every day I'm reading the real is at its lowest value against the dollar in decades. Inflation is, of course, rampant. Um, if sanctions were being enforced, more were being imposed, and that would lead to uh, a collapse of the economy, what would be the mechanics of that? What would it actually look like, and how would that uh, expedite or uh, facilitate the fall of the regime? So the regime right now has a very narrow base of support, a very small percentage that's ideologically connected to the regime. They accept the regime, the apocalyptic, radical Islamist ideology. Then you have the oppression machine. The police, the IRGC, the besiege. For that oppression machine to work, you need money. So they recently, or I think it was a few weeks ago, they increased the salary of the security forces by 20%. So for that, you need money. For that oppression machine to work, you need technology, like the technology of filtering that you see the technology of creating a intranet, national intranet that you see, uh, the technology of monitoring that you see. So if you have the sanctions, you don't. they don't have this money to fund the oppression machine. They don't have the capacity to acquire technology for the oppression machine. And the third part is there are segments of society that they do not agree with the regime. But the regime offers them economic opportunities, mm. financial reward, to buy their loyalty. So if they don't have the money, 
if the economy tanks, if you have a collapse of the economy, the oppression machine will not work like before. And this segment of society that they are buying their loyalty, they cannot buy their loyalty. And beyond that, uh, if you have like this economic problems, it, it adds to discontent in the society. And that's, that's good for revolution. Mm. Let's be honest. That's good for the revolution. So if you, if, if the Western governments want to help the revolution, they have to add the economic pressure. If they want to help the regime, they have to lift the sanctions, not you, add the economic pressure. You, you have to, I, I would assume, you have to be familiar at this point with the arguments that are made uh, against uh, sanctions. Um, the, the chief one, uh, put as simply as possible, is that um, these kind of um, sanctions don't uh, affect the, the, the leaders, the regime who are continuing to live high off the hog, but affect the people of Iran, the citizens who then struggle and live in poverty and are, are even weaker in terms of defending themselves and fighting this regime. Um, how do you respond to that? First, it's true that they don't affect Khamenei personally, right? But they affect the base that I discussed. They affect the oppression machine. They affect that base that the regime needs to buy their loyalty. And it's true that sanctions also affect the general society. And that's why we came up with the idea of the maximum pressure on the regime maximum support for the Iranian people. What, so, is that, what does that mean? So the maximum support for the Iranian people, for example, is that the regime wants to uh, up their communication with the board, right? So let's help them by providing uh, access to uncens uncensored internet, whether it's VPN, whether it's a uh, satellite internet, uh, for example, right now we we know that the uh, Sterling terminals are in Iran. Uh, one, there are two problems, however. There. One is that the Sterling production is not enough. If you want to uh, saturate the Iranian uh, space with this internet, so you need some kind of public-private partnership with internet to increase their production capacity in an Iran-related program, for that we need money. The second part is that, so if you want to send these terminals to Iran and then have the service, the monthly fee, someone should help. Because then we are talking about billions here. So that someone can be the United States. That's part of the maximum support. Where the money comes from, part of it can be from the normal budget that the, the US government has. Part of it can be from the idea that I just raised. Confiscate this illicit shipment of Iranian oil, sell them in the market, use the revenue to fund a project like this. Another project is like a strike fund or protest fund. So Iranian laborers, they want to go on strike. But the problem is that uh, because of the economy, um, because of the regime mismanagement, and yes, partly because of sanctions. They are poor. So if you have a strike fund, you can actually help them financially, then they can go on a strike. Same about protest fund. So this needs money, the US government can help, as I said, partly from the, the normal budget that we just gave $100 billion to Ukraine, Ukraine yep. which yep. is a very good thing. We can do we can do the same for Iran. And for Iran, you can do the, what I just said, uh, confiscate the illicit oil shipments. If, if I were to guess, I mean, if I were to sort of do an un, unscientific uh, thought experiment in my own mind, I would, I would say, based on what I see and hear in the interviews I've done on this program, the ground has shifted uh, when it comes to popular support for sanctions amongst Iranian Americans or I Iranians around the diaspora, maybe even Iranians inside Iran, in the same way as the ground has shifted away from reformism in a profound way to, to you know, uh, one solution revolution, uh, is, is that true? Do you do you feel like there's more support than ever for the position that you're advocating? I think so. I think especially. 
among Iranian inside the country. I think this has been happening uh, much longer during these five years of protests that we have since, since 2017. There hasn't been one slogans against sanctions. The slogans were, were all against the Islamic Republic. They were actually saying uh, they are lying that the United States is our enemy. The enemy is here, which is, a, <clears throat> I think, a direct response to many things that the regime says. So I think, yes, we, we, are, we are in a strong position right now. And it's really time to back this ma to maximum support, maximum pressure. And unfortunately, we, we, don't, we don't have much of it. We, do, we don't see enough pressure on the regime and we don't see enough support for the Iranian people. Like in the, in the case of the Starlink, as I said, right now we have the way to send terminals to Iran. It has been done. The problem is uh, the financial problem. Resources. It, I mean, it raises a difficult question, which is that um, if, if your premise uh, that determined enforcement of U.S. sanctions could help drive the regime into a corner, uh, if that's true, is the opposite then also true, that without the enforcement of those sanctions, you fear that this revolution won't happen? I, I think it actually can help the regime, yes. I, I, it's difficult to predict what's going to happen, uh, and the main factor is always the will of the people, whether they want they 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 can stay in the street for 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 a long time. What there are there are so many factors we can discuss it. But one key factor is yes, whether the regime has the financial resources to fund its suppression machine, whether it has the financial resources to buy the loyalty of part of the society. And if we don't do that, the chance of uh, this revolution to succeed goes down. It's a it's a it's a good pleasure and um, an education getting to talk to you. Thank you for for doing this. Before I let you go, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, point out or ask you. You know, you are an economist. You're a, you're a finance guy. You're a PhD. Um, but anyone who searches your social media would see that you've not been shy about demonstrating that you believe uh, Reza Pahlavi should be someone we should be directing our attention to these days. Um, t tell me about believing that he is the answer look i'm not a monarchist by dna like i'm not coming from a monarchist family i have i haven't been monarchist for a long time like i i have been republican for uh, <clears throat> most of my life uh but why i think the the crown prince is the best option it, the first thing is that he has a huge support in Iran. Again, you just have to listen to what people chant. You just have to look at the, what people write on on the walls in Iran. And he is the only person whose name, his dad's name, his grandfather's name has has been has been chanted. You see uh, Pahlavi's name on the wall. I'm not saying everywhere, but you see a lot of evidence of that. So. That's the guy who has the support. And more important thing, you don't see anyone else having this support. No one else else's name is being chanted. No one else's name is being written on the walls anymore. So th he has support. And if you look at the history of Iran, so between Pahlavi, you have the Islamic Republic, uh, Pahlavi is between Islamic Republic and the Rajar dynasty. And in both cases, Iran was a miserable place. So there is something about that ideology that the Pahlavi dynasty had that made Iran a better place at that time. And the Iranian people actually remember that. And that's why uh, the crown prince has support. He, he, he himself has provided a vision that the Iranian, uh, many Iranians like. But I think also part, part of his support is coming from uh, that experience that Iranians had. Are you are you someone who believes that um, you know we had Kavish Shahruz here a few days ago who was 
he's somebody who advocates this kind of a coalition or the um, people in the opposition, uh, uh, the big names in the opposition uh, of some sort coming together so there's a unified voice. Are you in that camp? I, I think that having a leadership for this revolution is absolutely important. You need to have a leadership and a unified camp, something they support. Uh, but it should be there, sh there should be some conditions, and that conditions should uh, appeal to, to, to the Iranian people. Like having a secular democracy, the importance of territorial integrity, accepting that the Iranian people, and only they, they have the right to choose which form of the government they want, whether it's monarchy or, or republic. And I want to make, make a point about monarchy. Uh, monarchy in in the Middle East, at least, has been much more successful than republics, and there are reasons for that. It's not it's not just a coincidence. So I think we have to uh, we have we have to understand uh, these factors. We have to understand who can help us to succeed. Who can help this revolution to succeed? We have to ha have some ideas about what will uh, what can happen after the revolution succeed because iran is in a specific geography iran is not in europe iran is <clears throat> so you need to understand uh the characteristic of that geography the history of it and based on that i think the, the crown prince can unite the opposition and i right now i'm a monarchist right I think when the revolution succeeds, uh, constitutional monarchy is the best option for Iran. But that's the decision that Iranian people will make in a free, free and fair election. Dr. Saeed Qasem uh, it's um, uh, I very much appreciate you coming on the program and, and um, giving us your time. Thanks so much for this. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Bye bye. Merci. Khodafis. Thank you to Saeed. Thanks to all of our guests today. Uh, and thanks to our Rook Roundtable participants and team members, Pega and Shia. Thank you to the amazing team who put this show together. This is full time for Rook for today. Roham, Anahita, Parisa, Merdad, as well as Pega and Shia. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. Support us at rookmedia.com. Find me on Instagram at Giangomeshi. Mizunbashi. Mizunbashi.